Before I introduce our speakers, uh, I want to uh, take a moment to thank HSBC, which is the Global Forum presenting partner for hosting this roundtable tonight. Uh, let me introduce the panelists and then I will invite you. Actually, why don't you all come up and take your seats while I'm introducing you. Uh, first of all, the uh, co-chair of the Fortune Global Forum and the chair of Fortune's Most Powerful Women International Summit, Nina Easton. Uh, she will be leading the conversation along with the senior vice president of iFlyTech, Madam uh, Doranda Du, who you were introduced to earlier. Uh, HSBC chief executive for global commercial banking, Noel Quinn, and the chairman of the China, Britain, U.S. Business Council, uh, Lord Sassoon, and also professor of marketing and strategy at Imperial College Business School, George Yip. Uh, please join me in welcoming them to the panel. Thank you, Alan, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I, I think this is quite, as you all know, being in this room, quite a pivotal moment in the history of UK-China business relations, and it's exciting to be here with this quite esteemed panel to provide some insights. I thought it was highly symbolic that uh, not long ago we saw the first direct train leave Britain, arrive in China, crossing some 7,400 miles, carrying everything from alcohol to baby products, uh, and uh, landing in China. As, of course, as part of the One Belt, One Road initiative, and London being one of 15 cities now, that the 15th European city to have that direct rail link. Uh, one um, optimistic analyst wrote, Britain will play a pivotal role in building China's new Silk Road, cementing London's position as the world's financial center post-Brexit. Uh, so we want to drill down a little bit on that and also uh, on innovation, uh, to talk about the innovation that we're seeing coming out of China and the UK and where there are not just, there's often a lot of focus on risk, but there's also we see tremendous opportunity moving forward. So Lord Sassoon, I wanted to start with you. Um, you, I believe that you said, told me the China Britain Business Council actually has its roots in Canton. Or you had um, your roots in Canton. Well, my, the, my, in my day job, Nina, I work for Jardine Matheson, known in China as Yi He, that was founded in Canton okay. uh, in 1832. So we've been doing business um, for 185 years, with a short break of about 30 years um, in, in Guangzhou. So you personally have personal ties and, and interest in this, and um, you are not only head of the council, you are uh, have been an esteemed uh, government advisor, in, including to um, then Prime Minister David Cameron. Let's start with the question of Brexit uh, and the past election of just a few days ago. A couple years ago, there was talk of a golden era between the UK and China. Is that, does that still hold, given these political events? Uh, yes, I think it very much does, and in, in fact, uh, uh, I was at a d well, hosted a dinner last night for um, the Guangdong Party Secretary, Hu Chunhua, and there was a lot of talk about um, the golden era still being alive and, and building on it, and, and you know, why, why is that? I mean, I think that uh, Brexit or no Brexit, the UK still remains the most open of the major global economies to inward investment. I mean, is there any other country, developed country in the world that would be inviting in um, Chinese financing <coughs> and in due course um, Chinese um, hardware into the nuclear industry? You know, Huawei, I mean, I don't, you know, there shouldn't be just a sort of US-UK comparison, but, but Huawei we've welcomed in subject to very um, uh, sensitive security clearance and, and they're providing the backbone of, of the UK emergency services <coughs> network, um, replacing another global company whose systems uh, are not as good. So I think the, one of the things that is very interesting to China is, is inward investment. I mean, in Knowles sector, I, I think the Chinese have made a strategic bet on London as their yeah. um, global entry point to the, uh, the the world's financial markets. I think that very much came from uh, Wang Shishan when when he was um, vice premier, and 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 it carries on, and it's not going to change. Um, uh, I don't think with Brexit, and and then when you layer on um, the fit on technology, we may come on to Belt and Road, where um, I, I think the UK um, has the most complete set of. of 
financial and professional services that fit with China's construction and engineering muscle, um, again, there's a very good fit. So I, I'm very optimistic about the prospects for the UK and China in economic terms, and that is underpinned in political terms by, I, I would say, the UK um, being the most consistent um, nation um, in favour of free trade and investment um, uh, through different governments over, over generations. So um, that, again, is something which um, I think China values when it comes to um, debates uh, uh, in, in, in global forums. Noel Quinn, um, you are now HSBC Chief Executive of Global Commercial Banking. You, your duties are worldwide. However, you spent time in Hong Kong, uh -huh. uh, and you uh, have a deep interest in the region. Uh, let's. Uh, what is? Do you agree with Lord Sassoon in terms of optimism? And what are companies feeling um, about the UK economy and relations with China in in general moving forward? Um, well, let me probably talk first of all about the UK economy and UK businesses, of which we bank around about 900,000 here in the UK, and how they're feeling at the moment. Then I'll move on to, to China and the opportunities for them. Um, firstly, what I would say is post-Brexit, they have continued to perform extremely strongly as a business community, and the second half of last year exceeded all expectations with respect to trading performance, business profitability, and they basically were extremely resilient and said, we'll carry on. There is political uncertainty, there is uncertainty around free trade and our position in the European market, but we're gonna carry on. And I think we should recognize actually the last six months of last year, they traded extremely well and that has continued into Q1. So there is a resilience. And I think moving on to, the, to how they currently feel, if I have one concern, the UK business community is not reaching out to the rest of the world as much as maybe some of our European competitors are. Why is that? So the number of businesses in the UK that tend to export is sort of in the 20 to 25% range. And I think what Brexit does is it demands more export led activity to other markets. And I see China as a huge opportunity for them. Um, if you look at the GDP per capita growth curve of many of the cities in China, and you look at the current GDP per capita in the likes of Guangzhou and Shenzhen and, <coughs> and the like, it is at a tipping point or reaching a tipping point where those cities in China will become attractive consumer markets for businesses from around the world, and particularly UK businesses looking to China as a consumer market that they can serve. If I look at um, the businesses I used to see in China when I'd go there, I think the UK corporate base that is in the infrastructure space, engineering, construction, architecture, they are doing extremely well in entering China and providing services and partnering with China businesses in, um, in some of the infrastructure spend that's taken place there. Um, I think there is one concern for UK businesses, and that is... How do, I, how do I get my first foot in the door? Particularly if you're a small business in the UK, how do I get my first entry point into China? Mm -hmm. I think we, the, the UK support community and the government, need to do more to help people enter China. If I look at um, the, what's happening in the innovation space in Guangdong as a, as, a, as a province, if I look at what's happening on Belt and Road, there's a huge amount of opportunity. And where, let me ask you both before I move on to George, um, James and Noel, where do you see opportunity for UK businesses going forward? That's a, that's a very big question. I, yeah, mean, we, I realize uh, that, yeah. Uh, but but I we'll, mean, I was just thinking about the video we saw. Yeah. I mean, I noticed the Guangzhou Opera House there, designed yeah. by a British architect, sadly um, died last year, Zaha Hadid. Yeah. So I think, you know, to underline Noel's point, I think the creativity mm -hmm. here, I mean, I... I, I, I mean, we all know the great Italian and French brands, and they're going to continue to do fantastically well in China. But if you think about um, fashion and design, for example, we see um, all the Chinese um, 
platforms um, for internet commerce coming here and looking for more interesting kind of second tier brands which have got stories now I mean you couldn't call second uh, Stella McCartney maybe a second line brand but you know I mean there's a there's a brand becoming increasingly global and well known um, which has a really interesting story to tell um, ar around what uh, Stella McCartney is doing with with her fashion um, brand so I think it's 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 at every level of media content I mean, the, the British television programs are obviously all over China. So, so in the creative industries, um, there's an awful lot. In technology, I mean, I would I would argue that Tech City and on the fringes of the city of London is is well, most people would agree is probably the um, uh, the third largest um, tech conglomeration um, uh, nowadays, and and. Uh, delegations of, of Chinese are coming over all the time to see what uh, what what's coming up in 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 that sector. We've talked about um, professional um, uh, services, but I think these these are all the things. I mean, the the the. the, the Guangdong Party Secretary. What was he really interested in? He was he was talking about university collaboration. He was up in um, Edinburgh um, two days ago. Um, university collaboration with with Guangdong. He was in Birmingham looking at advanced manufacturing. Um, so um, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to knock or to forget that that the UK is a bigger manufacturing economy than France, for example. There is a lot of really exciting stuff going on, and that's what China's interested in. No, did you have? I, I was in um, Silicon Valley just about 10 days ago, uh, meeting with one of the well-known brands that we would all recognize. And they were definitely asking me about um, Tech City and wanting to know, can we help them get in contact with some of the businesses in Tech City because there's so much innovation taking place, so much creativity taking mm -hmm. place. And I think there's great opportunities, Silicon Valley, Tech City, and what's happening in the Pearl River Delta and the innovation uh, drive that's taking place there. There's huge opportunity for collaboration between the UK and China on technology, huge. And that's a nice segue to George Yip, who, um, like these other two gentlemen, has a foot in UK and, uh, um, and, and China. As uh, So prior to joining the Imperial College Business School, you held a top uh, post at the China-Europe International Business School, co-owned by China and the EU, correct? Um, and George, interestingly, is author of a new book, China's Next Strategic Advantage, From Imitation to Innovation. So George, give us your um, take. You've, you've, um, you've said that Western companies can actually learn a great deal about innovation from China. That's kind of head turning given the reputation of China globally. Yeah, well, China's at the takeoff point of moving from imitation to innovation, and it's also doing it in a very Chinese uh, kind of way, um, using large numbers of engineers and scientists, lower cost, uh, moving very fast, failing fast now, and also being extremely customer oriented. So Huawei, for example, uh, developed the single RAN, which combined 1G, 2G, and 3G, but did it for Vodafone, one of their most important customers. Vodafone still says that the single RAN is a major source of competitive advantage for them. This is what Huawei wants to serve their customers. But now Huawei is innovating all over the world. It has a microwave um, design R&D center in Italy because it now can afford to hire foreign scientists. Another example, uh, Hire, the major appliances company, they pioneered the world's first refrigerator with three different temperatures. They designed this for the US market because the in-between temperature compartment was designed to store the food that is the most important for Americans. Do you know what that is? ice cream. Because when you take ice cream out of the ice box, it's too hard to eat and you have to wait. And Americans don't like to wait. <laughs> and it took a Chinese company to figure this out and to have the engineering and manufacturing capability to design and produce this cost effectively. If you want to be scared, China is now designing a warship that's going to sail just below the surface. It's not a submarine. It's going to be much harder to detect. And describe that a little bit because you and I were talking about yeah. this. It's a, it, 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 is a, it floats, but about three inches below the surface of the water in terms of the um, deck, but it's got turrets, etc. will operate like a warship, but much harder to detect. Now, of course, on a more commercial basis, they've just flown the first mid-sized jet to go up against Boeing and Airbus. Now, why are they able to do this, goes back to my reasons why China's innovating, is three things. China now has enough science and engineering capability to really learn from anywhere in the world and to take on almost you know, any kind of sector. 
Secondly, it's got the manufacturing capability, of course, which, say, India doesn't have, even though it has scientists. But thirdly, it's now got the world's biggest market in many categories, like commercial jet aircraft. Even the Japanese could not go up against Boeing and Airbus because their home market wasn't big enough. But of course, China's home market for new jet aircraft is much bigger than that of any other country in the world. So it's these three advantages that is now letting China innovation uh, innovate. In fact, it's happened only twice before in history. The British Empire, not just Britain, but the entire empire, and of course the United States commercial empire after the Second World War. And so China is now really going to make its mark. And we're seeing this uh, takeoff point. And once this happens, Chinese brands like Hire and Huawei will also start to get stronger and made in China will become more and more positive. So when we combine innovation, manufacturing, and the building of Chinese brands, if you were afraid of China before, you should be really afraid now. So made in China is going to be made, like made in Germany. It's the yeah. We saw the path that Japan took, right? Made in Japan used to be a negative, yeah, and it became superior. So just following through on the tech hub, port, like putting that together with the UK technology boom. How does that figure together in the future? Well, of course, uh, the UK can still contribute a lot. I, I was just wondering why the UK isn't, or maybe it is, the UK should be participating in the new C919 mid-sized jet program because the UK has huge experience with Airbus, uh, etc. So it should participate. It is, and components, are, they're, buying, uh, yeah. they're buying some of the, uh, the high-tech components actually exactly. from the UK. So we're, we are. So there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, like that. And conversely, China can help the UK, say, with infrastructure, because China builds a lot more infrastructure than the UK does. That's fascinating. So, Madam Du, just going, um, you're at the center of technology with artificial intelligence. Um, you, uh, Flytech uh, is, is very much uh, an artificial intelligence com uh, company that's yeah. the largest in the Asian Pacific region, you said. Um, where do you see innovation, trends in innovation and openness in the region? Oh, it's my great honor to be here today to see you again and share our understanding of the storming innovation in the field of artificial intelligence. I think, in fact, without openness and innovation, there will be no AI industry in the world. Several days ago, we have just celebrated our 18th anniversary and during all these 18 years, China's AI industry is developing and growing. Now, um, iFlatech's achievements, according to the vice mayor's highest inst uh, instruction, and we know our achievement result from the, um, our principles of, of the innovation and openness. Uh, for example, in the year 2010, iFlatech launched our voice cloud platform, providing free services through human-machine interaction. The platform is performing services more than 3.5 billion times a day, and with over 1.1 billion end users, and has collaborated with more than <coughs> 330,000 enterprises so far. So today, voice has become a crucial part in artificial intelligence, and it is the most natural and the simplest way of interaction, and also the most basic way of human communication. And now, uh, the internet of everything era has finally arrived. Uh, when you are far from the screen and in the mobile um, and the far field area, a far field state, a voice is the primary way of interaction, and the touching and the keyboard are supplemented. So uh, we have gained more than 80% of the market share in China's voice technology. Our ecosystem of <coughs> AI uh, industry is now ready, almost ready. Uh, now the artificial intelligence plus era is coming, and we have applied the periodical achievements of uh, iFlatech hyper brain to into many areas, such as education, medical treatment, financial, and customer service. So, um, 
so many. Um, I should have mentioned that um, Deronda Dew is also not only Senior Vice President of Flytech, she has a PhD in System Engineering from South China University of Technology and a postdoctorate in management, and that's very impressive. Um, let's take an opportunity now. May we test the iFlytech product? Oh, yeah. Because uh, that will give you an idea of the kinds of innovations, very specifically, that are happening in that part of China. I will admit, we've done this before on stage, the two of us, uh, in Washington, DC. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, this year, 2017, is thought to be the year of AI application. So we have achieved many significant uh, breakthroughs in the application of AI. And we have AI plus industry and AI plus individual. Mm -hmm. And now, the, this machine is our star product. And we call it Xiao Yi translation machine. It can translate Chinese into English and English into Chinese. And now, uh, could you please help me to have a Absolutely. short conversation? Yes. Okay, let's try. Uh, I'm wonder if the network is okay. <laughs> 你好, 我来自美丽花城广州, Flower City, Guangzhou. Have you been to Guangzhou? Yeah, you can put this button, hold it on, uh -huh. and speak English. Dr. Du, I have not been to Guangzhou, and I'm so excited to go to the city because there is so much interesting, cutting edge technology. <laughs> okay. Is it accurate? Guangzhou is not only beautiful, but also exciting and exciting. This year, in August, Guangzhou will be the Guangzhou is not only beautiful, but also full of innovation and vitality in December this year. Guangzhou will hold a global forum, and welcome to Guangzhou. Okay. I am mostly interested in the food and the flying drones in Guangzhou. <laughs> flying drones. Wow. Did it get the drones? Yeah. <laughs> it's correct. It, it was correct? Yes. Yeah, we were purposely testing it to make sure it would get drones and not just the food part. So good, good, excellent. It's no fly drones. <laughs> yeah, the, no fly drones, exactly. So um, how nervous should the West be with this level of technology coming online, Noel? I, I think the thing that always strikes me about China is not just the capability and the intellect and the the... The, the, the raw material, but it's the pace of execution hmm. in how quickly it goes from a concept and the development of an idea or the development of a technology or the development of a business plan and turns it from theory to practice. Hmm. And I, whatever industry I go to in China, that pace of execution and that commitment to execution is for me the defining feature of China versus many other markets in the world. Hmm. Um, and I, I see a commitment towards the creation of a higher added value industry base, technology base in Guangdong. It will happen, I have no doubt whatsoever. I can't say that same thing about many markets and at times, unfortunately, about the UK. It doesn't always execute the good idea, um, certainly not at the pace that China does. So I think um, I, I endorse the, the comments James, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic than Noel. I'm sure Noel's really very optimistic for Britain, but I, I do think... <laughs> I mean, we, we do have a challenge that we produce per capita more fundamental science. You know, you could measure it in Nobel Prizes or however you like it. We do, we do have a problem in translating um, our pure science and research um, into commercial 
products. But uh, I mean, if we can, if if we can partner with, um, you know, our friends from from Guangdong or wherever in China to um, help us do that, then I think we can we can share in the spoils. So I think there are plenty of things. I mean, we talked about financial services. I mean, um, uh, it, it, with no disrespect to the Chinese banks globally, um, uh, several of whom um, uh, are great supporters of my business, just as HSBC is. But but the you know some of the areas of, of financial services, including banking, you know, if, if, it, if it's putting the financing packages together for Belt and Road projects around the uh, the world, um, you know, I know where um, I would turn for the for the lead. So I think that, however you look at it, I think there are plenty of areas in which the UK can um, can still stand up for itself and and. Um, there's a de there's a delegation of some of the the best known names in of Chinese entrepreneurs, um, some from um, from Guangdong coming to the UK next month. What do they want to do? They want to go and see um, artificial intelligence, virtual reality companies here. They've seen that. Um, company with the um, unlikely name of Improbable, um, founded five years ago by some Cambridge scientists. Um, uh, SoftBank invested $500 million um, dollars, um, for, for about 50% of that company um, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, these things aren't <coughs> happening um, every week in the UK, but they're um, happening in a way that is attracting the attention of, of Chinese, Japanese, American investors, and I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. No, I, I'd agree with that. I think that's the opportunity. The partnership is a tremendous opportunity for the mm. UK economy. Um, but, so, uh, but that's the defining feature for me on China, is how quickly they can take yeah. the concept yeah. to execution. I agree. And George? I think, yeah. Well, of course, my own university, Imperial College of Science and Technology, one of the very top science universities in the world, is full of students from China. All right? So some of them stay here, uh, some of them go back. So there are tremendous uh, connections there. I mean, one of the reasons why China is developing an innovation is that the top ethnic Chinese who have studied, say, in the UK or in the US uh, at the top universities work for the best companies, China is attracting them back um, either to work in big companies or some of them are going back to China to start their own companies. So instead of saying starting up in Silicon Valley, you know, some guy, a 40-year-old scientist, will go back to China now and start a company there as well. And so, again, if they're coming from a British university, there will be opportunities to have links, continue to export services, et cetera, joint ventures. Right. As I th think it was James touched on, um, the UK is less, um, shall we say, fussy, sensitive about uh, partnering with the Chinese on technology, sensitive technologies, uh, yeah. nuclear plants, so forth. Um, where does that leave the United States? Uh, where do you see the United States moving forward in terms of, is the UK in some ways, I mean, you're talking in some ways apples and oranges, but in, in some ways is the UK a little better positioned, also with the Silk Road, is it a little better positioned on some things than the United States? Go ahead. Um, shall I have a go at that yeah. first? I mean, I, first, first of all, Nina, I, I wouldn't, I, Less fussy than the US. I mean, we we would say that for this sensitive technology, um, it has been put through the most rigorous um, testing. I mean, there are uh, in, involving our security services now. I know there are people in in, in the US who would say that that, that that we're not careful enough. There might be one or two here, but not very many. So, I, I think you know perhaps this is the ex-government minister side of me sort of bristling. But I would say that that that, that things are thought about extremely carefully here now. But 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 does this put us in a better position? I mean I I mean we have to recognise here we are in in the fifth largest economy in the world, not the largest economy in the world. So in terms of the importance to China on many rankings, geopolitical and others, um, you know, we are, we are a much smaller country. But I do think on, on uh, we, I think we will get advantage by t bringing this new technology in, which will be very good for our economy. And, and unless the US can get it somewhere else, it will be a small source of, of uh, relative advantage for those countries who are prepared to embrace it. Um, I, I do think the, U, the US, although um, uh, it's now taking a more neutral position rather than a negative position on Belt and Road, will miss out there. Yeah, that's I mean, the, U, the UK has got enormous credit um, um, for, for having been the, the lead nation um, amongst Western nations for having um, signed up for the AIIB. 
the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Now, that, that is only a relatively small component in this, but I think it indicates you know, w where the US thinking is opposed to the UK, which wants to be at the forefront of the pack. If, if US firms, law firms, banks, um, uh, insurance brokers, um, project managers don't want to be competing for every project with the, the hungry um, UK-based firms in those projects, then yes, I think there will be an advantage uh, to the UK. I wouldn't want to overstate it. The US economy is incredibly yeah. resilient and is generating vast amounts of its own technology, but I think it does give, um, it does give the, the UK something to work on. Uh, there is no doubt on Belt and Road, the UK business community has an advantage at the moment compared to the US business community. They are further down the track of um, exploiting that opportunity. As subcontractors typically, or both? Uh, advisors, subcontractors, uh, consultants, financiers. I think I see much greater engagement of UK businesses in those projects than I would see from the US. Much greater engagement. George, I, I what are the pitfalls still of doing business in China? What are the caution, notes of caution, when we talk about, for example, <clears throat> IP protection? And yeah, obviously, uh, protecting intellectual property continues to be an issue, but China is taking IP protection more seriously. In the last couple of years, it's built more intellectual property courts. Last year, more Chinese companies sued other Chinese companies for infringement of IPR than foreign companies suing Chinese mm. companies. So this is now becoming a very important issue for China. So this will uh, steadily improve. And the, Western, the many Western companies I've researched in China say they get around it by you know, innovating fast, changing what they're doing, taking a systems approach to embed their technology in a system which is harder to imitate than a single product, um, not doing all of the innovation of something in China, doing part of it you know, back home instead, so keeping some of the secrets uh, back in the West instead. So there are ways of getting around this problem. Are there questions? We've got microphones around. Are there people who would like to ask questions? Well, while people well, are thinking about their questions, well, exactly. just to add something, because yeah. I, I, I mean, there is a long way to go on IP protection, but there are some extraordinary developments going on. Okay. I mean, the, the, because the, particularly driven by the Chinese internet commerce sites who, um, you know, want, want to, I mean, on the one hand, they want to be attracting in um, British and other um, Western um, producers of, of goods to sell. On the other hand, they have recognised that going with that uh, requires more protection of the IP. So mm. one of the things we've been doing at the China Britain Business Council is, is signing a series of, of MOUs with the, um, uh, the Chinese internet um, commerce platforms under which, and this, I mean, it seems sort of incredible to me that, that this is unthinkable, I think, three or four years ago, under these um, MOUs, um, if one of our members, and, and we led the way, but other countries are starting to, to do these arrangements now, if one of our members identifies um, fake goods being sold on the major platforms, we now have a way to rapidly get the um, Chinese police and, and other authorities coming in, working with the, the platforms, working with our members, and it's starting to result in seizures of goods. So um, we can't talk about all of them, but, but there was a recent case where fake engine oil um, in very large quantities was being manufactured and branded um, as, as BP Castrol. So, um, uh, and... Um, Underneath the MOU arrangements that are now in place, the, the source of this is, is, is traced and um, millions of dollars of, of um, fake oil has been seized and people arrested. So this is sort of beginning now. You know, this is this is in the last few months. This is inconceivable three or four years ago. It's just the start. But but you know, I mean just I think reinforces for me the way that, that China is taking this very seriously now. Mm. Of course, they get even more annoyed if it's if it's stuff that's being fake fakes that are being manufactured elsewhere in the in Asia and being imported into China. So it's, some of that is leaking into the system. We shouldn't we shouldn't think it's all um, manufactured in China. That's a good point, Alan. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, you're talking about innovation. It's very interesting. Uh, one of the things uh, 
in the U.S. that drives innovation aside from startups is the fact that large companies have this fear these days of disruption, uh, worry that they may uh, lose the confidence of capital markets if they don't embrace new technologies. Uh, it's a little different in China with state-owned enterprises and their, their access to capital. And I wonder if you think uh, state-owned enterprise reform is an essential part of building an innovative economy in China and, and, and whether uh, that has to happen to make it to the next stage. George, yeah. Well, um, I found that, of course, the private companies are more innovative than the state-owned companies on average. Um, and uh, yes, they need to reform the state-owned companies. It's a bit of a problem right now because in recent years, the, the government... You know, which was running down the, the state-owned companies, is now reviving them again. So I think uh, the Chinese government faces some difficult decisions and some contradictions in terms of what it wants to do about state-owned companies. So I think we see different types of innovation. So you know, the more creative innovations are coming out of the private companies, you know, the Alibabas, the Huaweis, and the state-owned companies are more the you know, large-scale, brute-force kind of innovation using uh, large numbers. And Dr. Du, why don't you talk about the part of this, the, the third wave of artificial intelligence and China's push for artificial intelligence? I think China is thought to be, uh, um, will play a bigger part uh, in the third wave of the artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And it's estimated that in the next five to 10 years, artificial intelligence will be everywhere in the future. And China is likely to be the leading power of the, in the development of AI. Why? I think there are some reasons. And the most important thing is we should pay attention to the three factors of AI development. The first, the core technology in algorithm is required. Uh, this is the most important reason, I think. And many new algorithms uh, have been created, such as the DNN. Uh, each year, uh, as you know, the MIT Technology Review will uh, publish a list of 10 breakthrough technologies. This year, two technologies of iFlatX made in the list. Uh, they are reinforcement, uh, pain, reinforcement learning and the pain with the face. And China's AI technologies, represented by iFlatec, uh, Hyperbrain, and other companies uh, such as Baidu, Alibaba, <laughs> Huawei, <laughs> are ranked high globally. And China is constantly um, making breakthroughs in these core technologies. And second, I think the um, technology in cloud computing mm -hmm. is also required, and it will accelerate the revolutionary, uh, the ev evolution of AI. So, and uh, the third is the big data. Big data is the uh, different sectors of industry plays it will play a crucial role. And China um, has abundant resources of big data. There is a very vast number of users and huge markets in China. And in the report of China's effects on global innovation, um, mm. uh, some proposes that China is the best in innovating customer-centered and efficiency-oriented services. And last but not least, artificial intelligence has been uh, included in the national strategies in China so that we can amass a wide range of resources nationally and invest uh, more in the interdisciplinary areas such as establishing the national laboratories and application demonstration zones. So we have uh, confi uh, confidence uh, in building a better world with the artificial intelligence in the third wave Thank you, in China. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Well, it looks uh, cerebral. I'd like to ask a question uh -huh. because I'm not a but you do have to use a microphone, high yeah. technology. Thank you. Um, I'm someone who's been going to China for over 40 years. And I know that, and I've helped them in one area, and I'd like to ask you, they have the same problem as we have, which is housing and planning. If you go inside China, right in up to uh, 
Chongqing and places like that, there's a big problem of housing because one of the things advancing as you do in a society and improve the livelihood of the individuals, you've also got to give them better housing. And the housing situation in China at the moment is very serious. There are problems of getting good housing. And uh, it's a subject which I wonder if any of you are following closely. Um, I know that for another reason. You know we have here since 1974, uh, Chuen Lai put uh, the LSE, we have more Chinese mm -hmm. students than any other institution in England. Uh, nearly 40% of our students are Chinese. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have gone back and helped in this area. But I think housing is one of the biggest problems. And it slightly makes me smile because we have the same problem here in England. <laughs> Especially in London. Folks, any, James, you want? I have a first? comment on this. I, I just blanked out on the name of the company. But there is a, a, comp a very large company abroad that starts out in air conditioners, but now does prefabricated buildings that are completely sealed, very, very energy efficient. I've been in one of the buildings as it's going up. So China is also innovating in the way in which it is putting up buildings. So again, typical Chinese, you know, it's built for half the cost at twice the speed. So I think they could apply that. I mean, there, of course, there are other issues to do with housing, to do with land regulations, etc. But in terms of the construction, you know, they're starting to get actually a superior product through this kind of building technology that Broad has developed. And more sustainable skyscraping, skyscraper type apartments. And I think we have another question. Hi, I'm uh, Luis Alvarez uh, from BT. And I think that uh, you have described extremely well the speed at which innovation is happening. And, uh, and clearly, one area of that innovation in terms of technology is uh, security and cyber security. Mm -hmm. I would be quite interested to see what are your views uh, of how the impact of the cyber security, let's say, events that are happening could uh, affect collaboration or competition. Well, let me give you a bit of anecdotage on this. One of the, I mean, there are always so many um, extraordinary things I, I find. I mean, I've learned, learned one or two this afternoon from, from, from George. But um, one of the world's great um, cyber security um, experts, the world expert on pattern recognition, is um, a Chinese scientist who spent quite a lot of his um, early career teaching at Reading University, so just uh, mm. west of London, um, Professor Tian, Tan Tianyu, who then became a vice president, I think, of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And um, if you look at the Royal Society's standards for UK cyber security, so these are the, the Royal Society, the, the, the premier um, British um, scientific institution, the equivalent of, of the uh, China Academy of Sciences, the peer review panel of the top global cyber security um, academics who peer reviewed the UK standards includes the Chinese professor. So now I don't know where it gets you to. That's again, so again, Nina, the story to, of globalization. To an, Ameri yeah. to an American like you, you probably think this is terribly shocking. But yeah. and but I, I mean, you know, so I do think there are an awful lot of things going on between, in particular, the UK and China in some areas of huge sensitivity where scientists are working away in a very controlled way, including um, cybersecurity, which is not to say that, of course, the threat to UK firms from cyber, cyber attacks from wherever they're coming in the world um, uh, is, is not intense. And, and, and I think a lot of countries have to answer for, for what's going on in that space. So I don't pretend there isn't a cyber security problem. And I think, um, uh, you know, clearly China, and, uh, along with other countries, is, is one of those that's in the spotlight. Did you want to weigh in, George? Maybe? Yeah. No, I won't. Okay. Um, we're out of time. I'd love to just run down here and um, ask for advice that you might have for UK companies looking to partner with China or vice versa. George? Um, my advice to UK companies, they should also be conducting innovation and R&D in China as well as in the UK. Yeah. A lot of Western companies are doing that, which yeah. is interesting. Medical device companies and so on. There are um, 1,800 foreign-owned R&D centers in China today. That's amazing. 800, you said? 1,800. 1,800. Yeah. James? 
Uh, well, this is entirely self-serving advertising. Join uh, the China Britain Business Council. <laughs> we have the biggest network, 15 offices <laughs> across China. We reach the parts that other, other organisations don't and we'll help to try and um, uh, link you up with the Chinese partners uh, that are out there. Uh, a comment a client of mine um, actually shared with me on his approach 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when he entered China with his business. And it was the he, he lived the word partnership. He didn't say, I'm a UK business and I'm going to trade with you as a joint venture and I'm going to keep you totally at arm's length. He embraced the business. He embraced the concept of partnership. Um, he worked with, and I'm similar to what George is saying, he worked with the intellect and the capability and the skills that were resident in the China business that he, he entered a joint venture with. He took some risks, but he's had the payback because he treated it truly as a partnership between the UK business he owned and the joint venture he was an investor in. So I think you've got to approach it as a true partnership. Dr. Du, why should people do business in Guangzhou? Yeah. Uh, I think we should uh, use AI plus industry and we will help people to do more healthy and more happy. Mm. And uh, Guangzhou is a, a big city. I think it's, uh, it will balance, uh, balance the people's work and life. Mm. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I think now we go on to cocktails and dinner afterwards, but what an extraordinary panel. Thank you so much.